Hi, I'm Colin Adams, and I'm a math professor at Williams College, and I'm also a knot theorist. And that means that I study the mathematical theory of knots. Now, many people don't even think of knots as being a part of mathematics. It doesn't really have numbers and equations the way you normally expect in mathematics. But knot theory is actually a, an old uh, field of study in mathematics where there's all kinds of interesting things going on. And my goal today is to tell you a little bit about the history of knot theory and why people are interested in this mathematical theory of knots. So in order to start, I'm going to start with one of the most famous knots that maybe you're familiar with, the so-called Gordian knot. And here is a, a quote about what happened with the Gordian knot uh, relative to Alexander the Great. When Alexander reached Gordium, he was seized with a longing to ascend to the Acropolis, where the palace of Gordius and his son Midas was situated, and to see Gordius's wagon and the knot of the wagon yoke. Over and above this, there was a legend about the wagon, that anyone who untied the knot of the yoke would rule Asia. The knot was of Cornell bark, and you could not see where it began or end, ended. Now this is actually going to be the idea that we care about the most. So we're going to think about that in just a little bit. But let's finish the story first. Alexander was unable to find how to untie the knot, and unwilling to leave it tied, he struck it with his sword, because it would cause a disturbance among the masses. He struck it with his sword and cut the knot open. Uh, and it was said that now the knot was untied. But Aristobulus says that he took out the pole pin, a bolt driven right through the uh, pole, and uh, therefore it holding the knot together, and so removed the yoke from the pole. In other words, he cheated. But in particular, we're going to look more at this idea of this idea of a knot where there's neither a beginning nor an end. And that's going to form the basis for our idea of what a knot is. So I want you to think about it this way. Imagine you take a toy. I'm going to take this little toy called the tangle right here. And imagine I take it and I tie a knot in it. Okay, so I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to tie a knot in this. First, I have to make sure it snaps together. And I'm going to tie a knot in this. And right now, I can get that knot off there very easily, right? All I have to do is just push a little bit, and I can disentangle it. But if I take this same toy and I tie a knot in it, and then I glue the two loose ends together by snapping it closed, in essence, I've trapped that knot on the string, okay? So that I can't get that knot off, and it's actually there, and I'm allowed to deform the knot as much as I want, but it at least appears that I cannot disentangle that knot. Now, of course, you may wonder, if I worked long enough, would I succeed in disentangling? And the answer is, I don't know, right? The answer is, it might, be, it might take me six years of work, and I still haven't disentangled it. And how do I know in the next five minutes I couldn't disentangle it successfully, OK? So you'd like to have mathematical means to decide whether or not a knot is knotted. Now, once I have a mathematical knot, um, I can have different versions of it, so I can make it look different. You can see a picture of it that looks like this, or I can twist like this, or I can twist like this, and you see different pictures of it. But we consider those all the same knot. Okay, so we're allowed to have different pictures of the same knot. Uh, here are two of the most famous knots. The first one over here is the trivial knot that you see right here. So that's just a circle that has no knot in it. Then this one over here, this is the so-called trefoil knot. This is the simplest non-trivial knot. You'll notice it has three crossings where it type crosses itself in that particular picture of it right there. And in fact, you can get a whole table of knots. So here you see a table of knots where, in fact, this is the beginning of the table of knots, starting with the trivial knot, also called the unknot. Then comes the trefoil knot, and then comes some more knots, and they get more complicated as you go down the table. Um, here's a very famous link. Now, the difference between a link and a knot is a link is allowed to have more than one circle knotted. So you see in this particular example right here of the Bromian rings, it has three rings that are knotted together. Notice each of them individually is a trivial knot, but together they're linked together. Now, one of the nice properties of the Bromian rings uh, is that it appears in various interesting places. Number one, it appears in these carvings that are from uh, Viking era in the North Sea. And this knot is called Odin's knot, and it's kind of a stylized version of the Bromian rings. And so you see right up here, uh, this is also called the wall knot or the knot of death. And it doesn't look quite like a Bromian rings here, but it is a stylized version of the Bromian rings that you see right there. Now this actually appears, if you go to Italy, to Venice, Italy, and you go to the Borromea family house, this appears as their insignia, and it's carved on the doors at the Borromea house. And so here you see a carving of the Bromian rings on that door right there. Now interestingly enough, if you actually go and look at a lot of these doors, you'll find out that some of them are incorrect. So in particular, this one that you see right here, you're going to see that the crossings are wrong. So as I travel around the ring right here, you'll see I have two overcrossings in a row. It's never supposed to have any overcrossings that are the same in a row. So in fact, the people carving those doors made a lot of mistakes. But 
again, this is kind of an early period in the history of Nazism. Um, and so the interesting thing about the Borromean rings is it has this property that if you remove any one of the three components, so in this example here, we're removing the blue component, then the remaining two components become completely unknotted, unlinked rings. Okay? And any knot that has that property, or any link that has that property, is called a Brunian link. And what that means is if you remove any one of the components, the remaining co components just become a trivial link of however many components you have left. And so the Borromean rings is a very simple example of that. Now, this brings up an interesting question. Can you make Brunian clothes? Okay, so what do I mean by Brunian clothes? I mean clothes made out of Brunian links, such that if you were wearing such clothes, if you broke open any one of the little rings to remove it, the rest of the clothing would just fall apart. It would all just and boom, off it would come. Okay, so you have to be a little bit brave to wear Brunian clothes. Um, but this came up in a course I was teaching once, and two students and I actually wrote a paper about this called uh, Brunian Clothes, Not for the Bashful, and it was all uh, Brunian Clothes on the Runway, Not for the Bashful, and it was all about this idea of can you create Brunian clothes? And the answer turns out to be yes. So for example, I can create the following tube top, where what I do is I take a collection of little loops, imagine these sort of like those little rubber bands they use when you're doing orthodontia work, bending them in half and then connecting them through each other to create this pattern, this grid pattern that you see right over here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine taking that, taking that thing and putting it on a cylinder and gluing the ends so that the ends on the left side over here get moved over to the right side over here, okay, so that they're hooked around. So I create a cylinder out of these things. Now the interesting thing about this is if you take any one of these components and you cut it open and pull it out, in fact, then the next ring will be able to come out, then the next ring will be able to come out, and, and the whole thing will disappear. Okay, so there is such a thing as Brunian clothes. Now you might say, well, why would anybody want to have Brunian clothes? But, you know, imagine maybe on the molecular level there could be a use for some kind of a material that's made uh, in this way on the molecular level. Now, of course, um, knot theory uh, appears in a lot of interesting places. So, for instance, Celtic knots. There's a lot of Celtic knots and Celtic designs. Here's one of my favorites. Um, uh, whoops. And so, uh, here's one of my favorites right here. Um, this one here, you see this picture right here, it actually has 992 crossings, if you actually count all of the crossings that are in there. Um, I was on a plane once and bored, so I counted them all. Um, and interestingly enough, if you try to rearrange this knot to have fewer crossings, you will never succeed. And the reason for that is because it's what's called an alternating knot. Namely, if you get on one of the strands and you travel along it, you'll see that the strands go over, then under, then over, then under at each of the crossings that you see. And so it's an alternating knot. And there's a theorem from the mid-1980s that actually proves that for any alternating knot like this, what's called a reduced alternating knot, you cannot get a picture with fewer crossings. So this is the simplest picture of this particular knot that we see right here, of any picture that you could possibly draw of that knot. Now, of course, everybody knows that knots get used a lot in sailing. And this is a book. It's a wonderful book from the mid-1940s uh, called the Ashley Book of Knots. And in this knot, uh, Ashley actually went through and he talked about all kinds of different aspects of knots. Knots that bakers use, knots that surgeons use, but in particular, knots that sailors use. And so you can go to this book and open it to any page. And when you do so, you'll see all these beautiful pictures of knots. And so in this particular picture right here, you see a knot right here and then sort of in the middle of the page right there. And that one was used to create a beautiful picture of a knot. Uh, this is from a program called Knot Plot by Rob Shireen, um, which is this self-illuminating knot that you see in a picture like this. Now, um, I wrote a book about knots. Um, it was about the mathematical theory of knots. Unfortunately, when the designers were designing the cover, they assumed that it was about sailing knots. And so you see down the left-hand side of the cover here, they showed how to make a particular sailing knot. Luckily, we caught it right before it went to press, and so we prevented that from being the cover of the book. The truth is it might have sold more copies if I'd left it the way it was. Um, now, I want to look at some operations that you can do to knots. And one of the things you can do to knots is you can take one knot, and then you can take a second knot. So I have over here a knot on the far left, and then I have another knot right behind it here. And what I've done is I've cut a little piece out of each of them, and I've glued them together to create what I would call a composite knot. Okay? And uh, here's a fundamental question you can ask. Can the composition of two non-trivial knots yield the trivial knot? And so we're going to try that right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these toys, okay, and I'm going to tie a knot in it, okay? So I'm going to tie a knot. I have to be very careful to do it just the right way. But I promise you I'm not cheating. This really is a non-trivial knot. If I'm holding these two ends, I cannot disentangle that. That's really tangled. Whoops, I have it wrong. 
You got it right here, and it should come around like this. Okay, good. Okay, that's, that's really not it, okay? Now I'm going to take a second one, and I'm going to tie a knot in it. Whoops, I don't want to lose that. Okay, so now I have my two non-trivial knots. That looks the wrong way there. Okay, now I have my two non-trivial knots. I'm going to stick them together to create a composite knot. So I'm going to stick them together here and stick them together here. And the question is, can I disentangle this knot by just pulling it around through itself? Have I perhaps created the trivial knot? So I'm going to see if I can do it here. And I pull this around like this, this through here, around here, and bring this through. And the answer is no. Can't be done. Okay? Turns out you can never disentangle a knot that's created by composing two non-trivial knots. Okay? Now this took a long time for mathematicians to be able to prove. Um, and this is the kind of thing you want to be able to prove in knot theory. You want to be able to show uh, whether or not you can uh, disentangle a knot. So that's kind of a fundamental basic question. So it turns out that just as you have with prime numbers and composite numbers, so 7 is a prime number, 6 is a composite number, you have prime knots and you have composite knots. So we have the same theory reappearing right here. Now, of course, knots get used for a lot of other things. Here's, here's a particular use that I, I don't particularly condone. Um, knots also appear in literature in various places. So here's a quote from uh, Shakespeare. Come thou mortal with thy sharp teeth this knot intrinsicate. Here's a quote I like less. This is from Dr. Samuel Johnson's dictionary. Knotting ought to be uh, reckoned in the scale of insignificance next to mere idleness. So he didn't have a lot of respect for people who like to do knots. Um, this is a book that came out a while ago called The Shipping News. It won a lot of, won the Booker Award, uh, won the Pulitzer. It's a, it's a wonderful book if you get a chance to read it. And it, it ha takes as one of its themes, knot theory. And so in particular in this book, the frontispiece of the book is from the Ashley Book of Knots. And what it says is the following. It says, uh, take a knot, uh, a particular knot of, let's say, you know, eight crossings. So the particular one I have drawn there is one of eight crossings. So take a knot of eight crossings. Um, and then if you can change the crossings over and under uh, any way you want, you might create another knot or you might create uh, the trivial knot. And if you think about it, if you have eight crossings and you can change each one, that's 256 different pictures of knots. Now, interestingly enough, it always turns out that there is a way to change the crossings to turn it into the trivial knot. Okay? So let's see how that works. So the claim is by changing crossings, we can turn any knot into the trivial knot. And really that means any picture of a knot I can turn into a picture of the trivial knot by changing crossings. Okay? And we're going to do it on this example right here. Okay? So we're going to see on this example how I can change the crossings and turn it into the trivial knot. Okay? And this is going to be an argument that is an argument by roller coaster. Okay? I don't know if you've ever been to this roller coaster. There used to be a roller coaster, I think it was at Disney World, it was in Space Mountain, so it was inside a mountain, and you just went down inside the mountain on the roller coaster. And I want you to picture that, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take as if we're looking down on um, Space Mountain, so we're looking down, and I want to imagine that right at this top point right up here, right there, that's the highest point. We're looking down, remember, but that's the highest point for the roller coaster right there, okay? And then I'm going to move along the knot, following the arrow, the direction I'm going. And each time I come to a new crossing, I'm going to change that crossing to be an overcrossing the first time I hit it. So the first time I hit this crossing, I'm making an overcrossing. The first time I hit this crossing, I'm making an overcrossing. The first time I hit this crossing, I'm making an overcrossing. The first time I hit this crossing, I'm making an overcrossing. Keep going around. So I make that an over and over. But when I come back to a crossing I've already set, I do not change it. I leave it alone. And then I continue along, around, and I make it, that's a new crossing over. I've already set that one, that's an under. This is a new crossing over. That's an under, 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 all the way around until I get back to where I started. Now I'm imagining all of this happening as I'm going down around on my roller coaster until I get to the bottom. Then I'm going to take a straight elevator up to the top, which we can't see right here because we're looking down on the picture. So from the side view, what we see is something that looks like this, where we start at the top, that's the top of the elevator right there, we go down, around, 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 and around until we get to the bottom point, and then we take the elevator back up to the top. Okay? Now I could do this construction for any picture of a knot that I had. Change the crossings in such a way so I would always be going downhill as I followed the um, roller coaster around until I get to the bottom, and then I take the elevator back to the top. And you'll notice in this picture right here that I can always disentangle this. I can just pull those strands out of the way, and I have a trivial circle, as you see right here. Okay? 
So this shows that any notch can be turned into the trivial notch just by changing quantity. Okay, so um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the history of knot theory. Um, uh, where did it come from? Why are people interested in knot theory? And it really it goes back to the 1880s. And this is a Scottish mathematician, Peter Guthrie Tink. And at that time, people were very interested in uh, smoke rings. And so in particular, there were lots of various ways to make smoke rings. And at that same time, they believed at that time that all of space was pervaded with an ether. There was this substance that you couldn't see and you couldn't feel, but it was there, this ether. And what Peter Guthrie Tink wondered is, could you make vortex knotted rings in the ether. So you can imagine that I have some kind of an ether there. And uh, another one of the uh, physicists at that time was William Thomson, also known as Lord Kelvin. And Lord Kelvin was very interested in this whole theory of knotted rings in the ether. And so the question became, here's a vortex ring that you have in the ether, and the question became, could different elements just be different knotted vortex rings in the ether? So for instance, I might have over here, I might have helium, that could be helium. And over here, this could be lead. And over here, this could be gold. And um, this theory of knotted vortex rings could actually explain why it was that we had all the elements that we had. And at the time, people were very excited about this. Lord Kelvin said this was the best theory of the atom that we had at that particular moment in time. Um, and so we'd like to know, are those distinct knots? So we'd like to figure out whether or not different knots are distinct or are they same. And so this was an interesting approach to um, uh, the theory of the atom, uh, but unfortunately, uh, it didn't work out very well. Uh, we're going to stop there for now, and I will continue uh, in a later video. Thank you.